Again, this is gonna be a rather short game, but hey, I recorded enough for two clips for this one. That still means that all the footage I have of the WCW games is less than a single relatively short game, but still, this has been a bit of a fun ride. Okay, I could remember Monday Nitro, Bash at the Beach, Halloween Havoc, and Starcade, but I couldn't remember Super Brawl or Sold Out? Let's keep it at Nitro, especially since back then WCW seemed to book a number of their regular Monday night showings, like they were pay-per-view events. On the one hand, I want to chuckle that the Red and Black Wolf Pack has fewer guys in the heavyweight division than the Black and White. On the other hand, I want to feel guilty since, in all three WCW games, I didn't even want to look at tag team events or go to the cruiserweight division. Hopefully, I can get over that by the time we get to other wrestling games. This game has no wrestlers from other companies showing up, at least I don't think so. So no chance of seeing someone like Samoa Joe. It's all WCW guys divided up into their different stables. On the one hand, it's a shame that stables aren't as much of a thing these days. On the other hand, the NWO really showed how easily stables can go from an amazing concept of a new world order of wrestling shaking things up to a stale idea that just does not work out anymore, but you don't really know how to end it. Ah well, at least we don't have to worry about absolutely baffling booking decisions from the guys like Vince Russo here, or various bits of uh, backroom politicking taking the wind out of someone's sails because a more established star doesn't want to be given a loss, so I'm pretty sure that could have become a problem if the game designers had tried to coordinate with WCW's creative team to give this game an actual story. We don't really see any storytelling in wrestling games until I will finally get to LPing WWF No Mercy, or unless I skip over it for a bit to do some of the stuff that came from later console generations like the PS2. Huh. Honestly forgot that Rey Mysterio was in this game despite him showing up in the intro. Probably because I'm pretty sure that the WWF slash E treated him a lot better than WCW. Ah, I guess I was wrong and they did include some wrestlers from Japanese companies in this game. Oop. Okay, he probably got that name to somehow make a joke involving uh, the Men in Black movie from the 90s. It's a bit of a stretch, but dear god, I do not envy that man for having a ring name of Maya Inca Boy. Oh, good god. Ming Chi looks like such a cliche that he's almost offensive. And, of course, the guy with Hanzo in his name looks like a ninja. And, great, now I want to go through some Mortal Kombat games right now, just for some palette swap ninjas with some more effort put into them than this. Anyway, that seems to be the whole roster for this game. It's pretty expansive. I think I'll go with Goldberg here. I generally enjoyed his matches, and I distinctly remember getting into an argument with my first crush when Goldberg was going to go up against The Rock. I took it as good fun and some more banter. She took it as another in a long list of reasons to just give up on the admittedly kind of an ignorant ass that I was back then. Eh, bloody hell. Part of me hopes that I've become a better person in my 30s than I was around 12 or 13. The other part keeps finding excuses to go down memory lane, so it can be a little hard for me to tell just how much I've really changed from back then, from where I'm sitting. Anyway, this game apparently doesn't give anyone their theme music, which kind of ruins part of the point behind showing their entrances. Anyway, let's see just how quickly I can kill Disco here. I know, bit of a cheap joke to start things off with, but hey, it's not like I have anyone sitting with me on commentary here. I've got to try keeping things entertaining when every wrestling promotion I've ever watched has had at least two commentators calling a match, if not more. So it's not like I can actually draw on various announcers for all that much inspiration in my current circumstances. Okay, that 
replay thing is going to get pretty annoying in a hurry. No clue what I was going for there. I was just pushing buttons and trying to figure out what Goldberg's moveset is for this game. Maybe I should have just grabbed Sting since I got pretty used to him in the previous game, and there doesn't seem to be too many differences in the overall feel of the gameplay from World Tour to Revenge. Eh, hell, I know a lot of modern game designers wouldn't hesitate to use material from a previous game in a sequel if they could get away with it. in this one. Okay, so there's a move where apparently I can just punch at the guy until I decide to go for a grapple. But it's apparently easier for him to counter a grapple attempt from it. That's a bit weird. Okay, what the hell am I trying to do right now? Did they change a button from something that worked back in the previous game? Because I certainly know I wasn't trying to drag him into a corner in order to set up or something. I know the spear is one of Goldberg's signature moves, but I really don't think we need that kind of replay for it. Partly because I damn well know just how vicious some of Goldberg's spears actually could be. He was a rather stiff wrestler, and I don't think he ever really learned how to tone it down in all the decades he ended up going through. Hell, when The Rock was speared, he was cussing like his internal organs rearranged themselves. And some of the other spears I've seen over the years, bloody hell! I could swear Nunzio must have seen his life flash before his eyes! Okay, not sure why this game decided to have a cartoon referee show up. I certainly don't remember seeing anything like that in any of the other N64 wrestling games. I know Goldberg isn't a technical wrestler by any means, but dear god! That was just a punch to the back of the head! I was expecting a slam or suplex there! But then I also wasn't expecting one of Goldberg's moves to be grapple and then go to a punch-kick combo that looks somewhat awkward and can be interrupted at any random point for another grapple on top of the grapple. Eh, it's completely in character, no doubt about that, but just because it's in character doesn't mean it isn't a little surprising to me in this kind of game. He's trying to get to the top of the turf buckle, and instead he's pumping himself against the ropes. Again, not exactly out of character, but still a bit weird for me, uh, somehow. And now I have the distinct feeling that they changed what button is for pinning altogether. Doesn't matter if I'm mostly dominant in a match if I don't really know how to finish it off. Well, at least he was willing to climb the ropes for that! Okay, why didn't I just do the whole counter-strikes thing to avoid that? Do I just not really care that our virtual testicles are being used as a speed bag? Well, at least I figured out how to get him back on his feet. That'll be useful when we get our finisher. Well, this is effectively done. After the pounding he's already taken, I doubt he's breaking the three count after the jackhammer. 
part of me wants to feel guilty. I didn't really say much about Disco Inferno here. But then it's not like I said all that much about the various wrestlers we dealt with in the previous games, or Sting himself, even though that guy very much qualifies as a legend at this point. I somewhat appreciate the scorecard at the end of the match, but I, all I really care about in a wrestling match in a video game is who wins in the end, not how stylishly they did so. So I suppose these days I'd be pretty interested to see some style in an actual match I watch instead of one I play through. Eh, it's just one of those uh, things that shifts based on how you're experiencing the thing in question. In an actual match, this would be seen as an explosive start. In a game, it's just being aggressive. As a side note, the actual match between Goldberg and the Giant in WCW lasted around five minutes. Again, much like the Hogan-Goldberg match, it was on Monday Nitro instead of any pay-per-view event since WCW had their massive stars have massive moments, even in the weeks where they couldn't possibly get anywhere near as much money for it happening. And I'm pretty sure that while the giant slash Big Show managed to get some big moves against Goldberg in, it somehow felt more forgettable to me than Goldberg against Regal. Possibly because while Goldberg was one of my favorite currently active wrestlers at the time, the WWF had more of the people I liked watching in the ring. And, and well, I just wasn't paying that much attention by this point in WCW, I'm afraid. I'm pretty sure that Goldberg back in WCW was the originator of the whole T-Pose thing for dominance. Though I'm sure the pose has shifted what the body position looks like since then. So maybe I'm just stretching things a bit for the sake of more things to talk about at the moment. I'd ask how we managed to miss those first two strikes when we were that damn close, but at least we took him down with the kick. And now I can't help wondering why WCW gave a guy with a similar build to Andre the Giant the kind of booking that made it impossible to ever make him come across as imposing as Andre did back in the late 80s and early 90s. I can't really call bullshit on the WWF slash E never booking him the way they... Uh, I mean, just, uh, for one thing, WCW never gave him any mystique at all to start with. For another, when he eventually switched companies, he had gained some very bad habits from WCW and needed some time to have worked out and retrain before they could actually trust him with any major matches. As much as the announcers back in the day said it was amazing that Goldberg did the jackhammer on the giant, it certainly didn't feel that way when I saw it. I just kind of did an amused shrug that Goldberg had taken down yet another in his massive winning streak, and was confused why Pam Pan Bigelow showed up at the end of the match instead of during it. Wait, the giant got negative points in striking? How the hell do you get negative points? Oh, God. Bret Hart. This is definitely gonna feel a bit awkward from where I'm sitting, because I'm very much aware that Goldberg delivered the kick that ended Bret Hart's career. Goldberg felt guilty for doing it. Bret eventually kind of forgave him. But it just was the finishing touch of a rather brutal chain of events that made Bret Hart's life probably very miserable to go through. Hell, Bret's brother Owen died to that same year. Those two brothers deserve to be among the absolute greatest of their generation. I was never a major fan of either of them, to be honest, though I did as a kid mention once or twice that Owen Hart looked kind of like uh, Sean Bean, which of course prompted a bad joke from a former friend of mine I knew from elementary school that they really should have used Sean Bean in a movie involving wrestling since he's had so much experience with death scenes 
And a lot of pro wrestlers never make it to 40. Not the darkest joke he ever made, but I certainly wasn't laughing. Of course, I didn't know that to Goldberg versus Bret Hart signified the end of Bret's career. Hell, Bret himself didn't know. He entered the ring several more times after that, but the damage had been too severe and he just didn't move the way he used to. I know I should be talking about more lighthearted things to keep it fun at the moment, but that's where my mind wandered, and for an understandable reason considering the pairing we have right now. Why the hell is it so hard for me to manage to get into the top group in this game? Granted, I don't need the high-flying moves to cause some damage, but still, seems like an odd way to limit my offense around here, considering all the other things I could choose to do. But then I don't know if weapons are a thing in this game. It's not like I'm checking the crowd for baseball bats or under the ring for steel folding chairs. Certainly going through them at a good pace. Yeah, another match done, and I have quite a bit more footage to go through. Seems they just have you go through a lot more matches in this game to get to the championship than the previous WCW game. Part of me is a bit disappointed that we don't get a bit more match variety, since we're given so many more matches on the road to a championship. But hey, They've certainly given us enough fun. Or at the very least, it's fun for me as a person who lived through the 90s going through this particular time capsule. I'm not sure how fun it would be for people who weren't even born yet when WCW was a thing. Sure, the footage still exists, so people can watch WCW when it was at its hottest, but still, outside of someone else telling someone younger to watch older wrestling shows, I don't see that happening. Uh, all that often, but then, one of my childhood favorite shows to watch was MASH, and that was from a good deal before I was born. We all come to different forms of entertainment in different ways and all that. Anyway, I'm sorry to say that I don't know Brian Adams all that well. I just did a quick search and learned he retired back in 2003, and he actually went by the name of Crush when he worked for the WWF. I probably shouldn't be too surprised to uh, see a former member of the Tag Team Demolition in the WCW, considering how many other former WWF stars were in the roster when this game was released. And holy shit, even looking back at the old footage of Demolition there, I just never saw anything that made me go, Crush is something worth remembering. For one thing, I tend to think of the guys named Axe and Smash when I think of Demolition. He was literally a third man introduced to a two-man tag team for the sake of giving one of the first two a break while still letting them use the gimmick. Then he has the other issue where when I think of his very name, Brian Adams, I tend to think of the singer. The singer I remember best from the animated movie Spirit, Stallion of the Cimarron. Uh, I probably pronounced that last word wrong since I tend to just refer to it as the movie spirit. Probably not the best time to start randomly talking at length about an animated movie involving a horse that doesn't want to be tamed. We're here to beat a long line of people like government mules. leg before I get the chance to jack him. I guess
guess not. we really are going to get a submission instead of uh, nothing but pinballs. I'm sorry, Adams, but as impressive as it is that you managed to survive our finisher, this is still a rather one-sided match, and I'm already wondering who's next. Just how much more work do these legs need before he gives up? They've been getting bent so much I'm starting to think he's made of rubber or something. This much of a beating and he thinks he can get us in a roll-up. He has most definitely earned some good respect from me this far into this game. Of course it makes me wonder just how tough the wrestlers after him are going to be. I certainly wouldn't mind seeing some fights that are a bit more back and forth than the ones we've seen in this game so far, even if Goldberg isn't really known for having a lot of back and forth matches. And that does it! Brian Adams is done! I should be able to squeeze one more match into this clip, but the rest of the footage for this game is going to have to come in the next clip. At least my footage for this game managed to have more than just one clip's worth. That's definitely a sign that these games have been improving in quality to a degree. And our last opponent for the clip is Van Hammer, another guy I can't recall off the top of my head. The guy retired in 2003, started off in WCW in 1991, and had an incredibly short stint in the WWF. Where he lost to Virgil? One of the lowest guys in the WWF card. Now, I'm not gonna say that if you can't make it in the WWF, then I don't wanna know you or something like that. But it's unfortunately easier for me to go, oh yeah, that guy. When I look back at the WWF slash E, I'm sure he had some pretty solid moments over his career, and he wouldn't be the only WCW guy who got treated like crap in the WWF. Hell, what they did with Diamond Dallas Page when they got a hold of him was certainly pretty damn hard to defend. And I most certainly can't blame this guy for not going to the Federation after the WCW went under after his first time trying. He ended his career in less hostile, but undeniably less traveled waters. I can most certainly respect that sort of decision from someone who hadn't quite managed to make it to stardom. And dear God, I wish I'd come up with a way to say that which didn't feel downright insulting. Unfortunately, it's the truth. Not everyone gets to shine and become a legend. Sometimes you just show up, take your lumps, deliver some in return, and fade into obscurity as you collect your paycheck. Hell, that's how most people end up living their lives. No shame there whatsoever, and I hope he had fun doing it. There are a lot of punches to the head in Goldberg's moveset, aren't there? Both to the front and the back. I probably wouldn't even find it all that troubling if it wasn't for the fact that Goldberg legitimately caused Bret Hart a bad concussion. Maybe I should just be glad that Goldberg doesn't have a kick that goes to head height in this game. Why do I still enjoy this guy so much when he did such a major injury and was probably one of the most unsafe wrestlers to get pushed that high up the card. Eh, it just doesn't make that much sense to me. 11, 12, 13, 14, it 
would most certainly be embarrassing for anyone to get counted out if the count goes as high as 20, that's for sure. Of course, it's just plain awkward to see that pushing your chest out like Superman is somehow enough to prevent a spear from taking you down when it's landing shoulder first into your gut. This should end it. And that does it for the clip. Not sure how many more matches we've got before I'm done with this game, but I still feel a good amount of momentum going for me here.